Hello and welcome to the course introduction in the Applied ML course, course code 4DV117, given at the Linnaeus University. My name is Dr. Johan Hagelbeck and I will be the main instructor in this course. So, the course consists of mostly self-studies and some pre-recorded lectures to watch, plus some reading. We have three physical meetings, the introduction, which is this lecture, it's also given physically, and two workshops. Workshops are four hours each, between 10 to 15, we have lunch between 12 and 13. In the workshops we will work with practical examples, so you need to bring your laptop to these. It's not mandatory, but I highly recommend to attend the physical meetings, because you will be given opportunity to discuss the course contents and also questions about the practical tasks. We have two course web pages. Uh, we have the course press page uh, uh, containing all course contents, lectures, interactions, recorded lectures, etc. And my Moodle, uh, which we only use for submissions. With this is where you submit your assignments. You should automatically be added to my Moodle course if you're when you are accepted to the course and it will look something like this and if you scroll down a bit on the page you will see submission links to where you submit your assignments. The course press page looks like this. You have a whole menu to the left with all the lectures. You can find the data sets, all the tasks that we go through on the workshops and if you don't attend the workshops I highly recommend that you go through the tasks on your own and feel free to ask any questions to me. We have some reading as well. Uh, Mining on Massive Datasets, a very good book. It's available for free or for online if you satisfy with PDF version or you can of course order a physical copy if you like but that costs some money. The good thing is that I think it explains complex stuff in an easy way with lots of examples and it covers much more than machine learning so only a few chapters are relevant for this course. Uh, but it's highly recommended that you read those chapters. The Deep Learning book by Goodfellow, Benjiu and Corville, uh, also available for free online. It's a very good book but a bit mathematical and more comprehensive than the other book. So read the parts you find interesting and the parts that you want to go into more detail in. Two other good books that I recommend you to read but they're not mm, mandatory for the course. Deep Learning with Python by Francois Cholet and Hands-on Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn and TensorFlow from Aurelien Giron. Very good practical books with lots of practical examples if you want to use Python for machine learning. The workshops, we work on practical tasks, you get a list of tasks and some data sets to use. We learn to use different APIs, libraries and tools on different types of data and data sets. And you work through the tasks in your own pace and you focus on the ones that you found most interesting. The tasks are in Java, Python and R languages. You will also have opportunity to discuss lecture contents and practical tasks if you attend the workshops physically. The examination tasks for this course is a project you define on your own. So you need to select some data to work on, preferably from your daily work to get you something interesting for you to work on. But it's also possible to download data sets from, for example, Kaggle if you don't have anything in your daily work that interests you. The task is to gather, pre-process and learn from the data, evaluate different learning algorithms and describe your findings in a report. So we had two submissions. First, a short one to two pages description of your project. The deadline is on my Moodle. And when you got an accept from the course manager, you can start working on your actual project. And when you submit your project, you submit project files and a technical report describing your project, how you approach the problems and your findings, etc. It's not mandatory to submit your data. It can be if you 
have some data that are not meant for outside your work business. Uh, but the line is also available on my Moodle. And both you submit at the course page on my Moodle. Communication, the best way to get in contact with the course manager is by Slack or email, but preferably Slack. So I recommend you to sign up at coursepress.slack.com using your lnu.sc student email address, otherwise it won't work. And you join the channel for DB117. And all course information, all information from the course manager to you will be posted on Slack. So I highly recommend that you sign up for this channel. So that was everything about the course. So now we're gonna start off with some history of AI and machine learning. AI started with the paper Can Machines Think? Uh, it was written in 1950 by Alan Turing, published in the paper Computing Machinery and Intelligence in the journal Mind. And he discussed and reasoned about the question, can machines think? And this paper was the first to mention the widely known Turing test. And this test has become an important benchmark for AI discoveries. So it works like this. Uh, you have a referee or a judge that communicate with persons and computers by a text. It's a chatbot basically, so you only see the text. Uh, no speech or anything. And you don't know, the judges don't know who they are talking to, if it's a person or if it's a computer. And the task is for the referee or the judge to uh, see and reason about is this a human or computer I'm communicating with. And to pass the Turing test, the judges should judge all computers as humans. So, has it been beaten yet? We have come far, but arguably, no, it hasn't been beaten yet. There are a few variants of a test that have been beaten. Uh, one of the best attempts is Cleverbot, uh, and depending on how you define the rules, because Turing didn't define the rules exactly, uh, some might argue that by some metrics that it has beaten the test. In 2011, it scored 59.3% human compared to controls that were scored 63.3% human. So the humans got slightly more humanness so to say 63% compared to computers, 59%. But we're getting closer and closer. And many believe what we have come so far that the Turing test can be passed if we use average persons or judges. Uh, it can, however, not yet beat judges trained to spot non-humans. Some of the early attempts are ELISA from 1966 and Perry from 1972. And ELISA is available online, so you can play around with it, and it can be quite funny sometimes. So, this is what happened when I tried out ELISA. ELISA asked me, please tell me what's been bothering you. I said, I'm scared of spiders. Is it because you're scared of spiders that you came to me? Yes, I need help. I see. Can you help me? I asked. Really? I help you? You are a psychiatrist. What makes you think I am a psychiatrist? It says so on your office door. Why are you concerned over my office door? Because it says you are a psychiatrist and now you are telling me that you are not. Does it please you to believe I am not? No? Now I wonder if you can help me or not. You are being a bit negative. Now it's a working conversation but it would rarely fool people that this is not a computer I'm communicating with, if I knew that it's a possibility that it's a computer I'm communicating with. And ELISA works something like this. It tries to identify keywords in what the user typed, and if a keyword is found, the user sentence is transformed using some rules. And if a keyword is not found, ELISA responds with a generic reply or repeats an earlier user sentence. Eliza does not understand the meaning of a sentence, but still many believed 
in the 1960s that a licensed similar system could be used uh, instead of psychiatrist to uh, as communicating partners. Uh, if we look at what actually happens in this conversation, you see that some of the questions I asked why Eliza is rephrased and returned back to me. So that's how it works. So Alan Turing, uh, he was a highly influential in formalizing the theories needed to build a general purpose computer. And you also formalize the concepts of algorithms and computation with zeros and ones, which we all our computers today uh, are designed around. And during World War II, he worked on the Enigma machine that was able to break the German ciphers. And today, Turing is considered to be the father of theoretical computer science and artificial intelligence. And sadly, at the time, Turing was gay, which was a crime. Uh, and in 1952 he was sentenced to either imprisonment or hormonal treatment. And he chose the latter, which made him suffer from mental illness. And in 1954 he killed himself by eating a cyanide poisoned apple. And it was not until 2013 that he was given pardon, uh, much thanks to the work from uh, pop singer Neil Tennant from Pet Shop Boys. So, AI as a research, academical research field. Uh, at the Dartmouth conference in 1956, AI was first established as an academic field. And this conference was organized by Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy, Claude Shannon and Nathan Rochester. And the proposal included the following statement. Every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. Uh, quite words that we are not actually there yet. It says that we understand intelligence and all features of intelligence, which we know today that we, we don't. But this conference is considered the birth of AI. And it started off as the first golden years in the AI field from 1956 to 1974. And during the golden years, many discoveries were made and agencies like DARPA poured a lot of money into the AI field. And some of the important one discoveries were solving problems by search, which led to problem solvers in geometry. For example, the geometry theorem prover in 1958 and Algora, uh, for example, the Saint system. Search was also behind the planning system strips developed to control robot behaviors. Natural language communication, most notably ELISA, which we just discussed, uh, invented by Joseph Weizenbaum. And microwords, for example, simulations in physics by Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert. And it was a lot of optimism during this time. And all the researchers and, um, are very optimistic about what could be done with AI. Uh, for example, in 1965, Herbert A. Simon said, machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do. So basically, we have built fully intelligent general systems in 1985, which of course didn't happen. And in 1967, Marmin Mnitsky said, within a generation, the problem of creating artificial intelligence will substantially be solved. And Marvinsky Minsky also said the same year in an interview in Life magazine, in three from to eight years we will have a machine with a general intelligence of an average human being. And this didn't happen either. So they had a lot of optimism about the possibilities of AI, but it turned out that it was far more complex than they realized at the time. So after these golden years, uh, the first AI winter appeared between 1974 and around 1980. And during these years, the AI field was criticized for failing to solve the problems they faced. Uh, the optimists had raised the expectations impossibly high. We couldn't develop a general intelligence at the time, and we still can't. So most agencies cut the funding in the AI field. 
and the research in, for example, neural networks was almost completely halted for 10 years due to the devastating criticism from Marvin Minsky. He argued that since a single neuron cannot solve non-linear functions such as the exclusive OR, larger networks will have similar limitations. But today we know that this is completely wrong. Some of the problems the field faced at the time were limited computer power. A supercomputer at the time were capable of around 80 to 130 million instructions per second, MIPS, and tasks such as computer vision has been shown to require around 10,000 to 1 million MIPS. Also the combinatorial explosion, uh, still a problem today. Many problems could only be solved in exponential time, and moving from toy problems to real-world actual problems was not possible. Knowledge and reasoning. Knowledge about the real world, for example vision and natural language tasks, require a huge amount of information about the world. Something called Moravec's paradox. Computers are very good at proving theorems and solving geometrical problems, but for humans Simple tasks such as recognizing a face turned out to be extremely difficult. Just making a robot walk or recognizing what's in a picture it turned out to be very, very difficult for computers. And also the frame problem or qualification problem. Difficulty of describing and handling conditions in dynamic worlds. A real world changes is not static. The early AI system was to a large extent based on simple processing, logic and rules, and several philosophers argued against the claims made by AI researchers. For example, Hubert Dreyfus argued that human reasoning involved very little symbol processing, but a great deal of embodied, instinctive, unconscious know-how. John Searle put forward the Chinese room fort experiment which work like this. Suppose that we create an AI that behaves as if, if it understands Chinese. It takes Chinese characters as input and produces a response with other Chinese characters. And suppose that this AI is so good that it passes the Turing test in Chinese. The question is then, does the machine understand Chinese or does it merely simulate the ability to understand Chinese? And it argued that if the symbols have no meaning for the machine, the machine cannot be described as thinking, even if it solves the problem of communicating in Chinese. And Searle called this understanding of the actual language, strong AI, and simulating the ability to understand weak AI. I use some different names, but strong AI or general artificial intelligence or weak AI and specialized artificial intelligence. Many AI researchers did not take this criticism seriously at the time. Marvin Minsky, for example, said about Dreyfus and Searle that they misunderstand and should be ignored. Weizenbaum, who created ELISA, did not agree with Dreyfus, but said that his colleague's treatment of Dreyfus was unprofessional and childish. After this first AI winter, things started to happening again and started to be a bit more optimism in the field. Uh, in the 1980s, companies successfully began to use something called expert systems. And an expert system answers questions or solves problems about the specific knowledge domain using logical rules. The rules are derived from the knowledge of domain experts and expert systems were part of a new direction in AI. So we use human experts but define logical rules and these systems can be used to answer questions, solve problems in the specified domain. But during the 1970s, researchers began to suspect that intelligence might very well be based on the ability to use large amounts of diverse knowledge in different ways. This was a quote by Pamela McCorduck. Intelligent behavior depends on dealing with knowledge, sometimes very detailed knowledge of a domain. Uh, and knowledge-based systems and knowledge engineering became a major focus of AI in the 1980s. We also revived interest in neural networks, and in 1982 John Hopfield proved 
that a form on neural networks, which are called Hopfield nets, could learn and process information in new ways. And around the same time, David Rommelhart popularized bad propagation for training neural networks, which we still use today. Uh, but the actual algorithm was first published in 1974 by Paul J. Burbus. And these two discoveries revived research in neural networks. But it was, however, not until the 1990s when neural networks became commercially successful for tasks such as optical character recognition and speech recognition. But then came the second AI winter uh, from around 1987 to 1993. But unlike the first AI winter, advances were still made in the field during this period. Research was ongoing. Uh, the collapse was more about how the field was viewed by government agencies and investors. And once again, expectations have been higher than was actually possible. Uh, for example, a goal listed in the Japan's fifth generation project for 1981 was to carry on a casual conversation. And this has arguably not been met today. The interest in expert systems were fading uh, because they proved to be very difficult and expensive to maintain and update. They could also make huge mistakes when given new and unknown input. They were still useful but only for a few very specialized tasks. But around mid-1990s, the modern AI period started. And during this period, the AI field was able to achieve some important goals. AI systems were also successfully used in the technology industry, mainly due to focus on isolated problems and increasing computer power. But the reputation of AI was now very bad, and many discoveries and achievements were made somewhat behind the scenes. And AI researchers also did not agree about the reasons for earlier failures and the field became fragmented into subfields. And today a lot of things have happened with the deep learning boom, which really have uh, risened the expectations about what is possible with AI. Some milestones. Uh, in May, on May 11th, 1997, Deep Blue became the first computer system to beat a world champion, Garry Kasparov, in chess. And instead of understanding how a human played chess, Deep Blue actually searched for all combinations of future moves from the current board state. So yet again, Deep Blue doesn't understand chess, it just merely searches for the best possible move at each it could easily search 14 moves in the future, sometimes up to 40 moves. And Deep Blue was custom built for chess playing and could process around 200 million moves per second, which was extremely fast at the time. The event was also broadcasted live on the internet and had over 74 million viewers, one of the first large broadcasts over the internet about AI. In 2005, a Stanford robot won the DARPA Grand Challenge by driving 200 kilometers on a previously unknown desert trail. Two years later, a team from Carnegie Mellon University won the DARPA Urban Challenge by navigating 88 kilometers in an urban environment while avoiding hazards and adhering to traffic laws. And self-driving cars are very high interested in today. In 2011, uh, a very interesting milestone happened. The IBM developed the Jeopardy playing system, Watson. And, and Watson met two grandmasters in, in, in the game, uh, Ken Jennings and, and Brad. Uh, and these two guys were, would have won a lot and lot of Jeopardy games and were really good at this game. Uh, and Watson, uh, as a supercomputer, actually beat those two. Uh, um, and I highly recommend you to watch the YouTube clip about it if you haven't done so. Uh, Watson is what we call a question answering or QA system. The difference between a QA system and simple document search is that a QA system tries to understand the question in detail and returns a precise answer to the question. And this was 
one of the great challenges that Watson solved that actually understanding the question because the questions are reversed and written quite special ways in, in Jeopardy. And IBM states that more than 100 different techniques are used to analyze natural languages, identify sources, find and generate hypotheses, find and score evidence, and merge and rank hypotheses. And some of the techniques used in Watson are natural language processing, information retrieval, knowledge representation, automated reasoning, and machine learning. Watson had access to millions of documents from Wikipedia, dictionaries, encyclopedias, newspapers, etc. So it didn't have an answer stored for each possible question. Instead, it had a lot of information poured into the computer and it searched for possible answer in all these documents. And innovation was that instead of using a single algorithm for language analysis, Watson executed hundreds of proven algorithms in parallel and evaluated the responses. And the more algorithms that returned the same or similar answer, the more sure Watson was of being correct. Watson has also been used successfully in other domains such as healthcare, a decision support system for medical professionals when treating, for example, cancer. It has been used as teaching assistants uh, in electronic teaching, material to provide natural language one-to-one -one tutoring to students. <coughs> Watson was also used as a teaching assistant at Georgia Tech, where it answered questions. It was 97% certain the answer was correct, leaving the rest of the questions to human teaching assistants. Jeff Watson, a cookbook, suggests unique dishes based on what you have in the fridge. And weather forecasting, the Deep Thunder project started at IBM in 2016 and still ongoing. And also, and more. And Jeff Watson is uh, quite funny. Uh, you can uh, say what you have in your fridge and you get some interesting examples. Like I had salmon, I think it's a good combination with plum and parmesan cheese and uh, cremini mushroom and you'll get some ideas about what you can cook salmon pasta salmon stuffed vegetable um, it also thinks that green apple is a good combination with ginger rooibos tea and cardamom and you get some interesting green uh, dishes green apple cake green apple bush de noel so you can play around with it, it's quite funny and maybe you feel interested in trying one of the dishes. Uh, and Watson has an API that can be used to create uh, quite interesting applications. And it's also possible to submit documents to, for Watson to learn from. And for example, the company Stenaline uses Watson to analyze CVs and contracts. And they also have a chatbot called Stena that is based on Watson. Another AI paradigm that has successfully been used for many tasks is intelligent agents. And agent systems became popular during the 1990s. An intelligent agent is a small entity that perceives its environment and takes actions to maximize its chances of success. And the single agent itself is not very smart and not very complex. But when we come to multi-agent systems where multiple agents collaborate, uh, they can solve important tasks such as optimizations in electrical grids and distributed heating systems. In the early 2000s, uh, AI researchers began to develop and use mathematical tools more than in the past. And the researchers in the field realized that many problems AI faced were already being worked on in fields such as mathematics and economics. And the shared mathematical language allowed for more cross-discipline collaborations, leading to many discoveries. And Russell and Norvig, uh, authors of a very famous textbook about AI, uh, even called it nothing less than a revolution. So we started to have a mathematical foundation behind how we expressed what AI is and how the algorithms worked. And in 1988, Judea Pearl wrote a highly influ influential book that brought probability and decision theory into AI. And it laid the foundation for Bayesian networks, hidden marker models, information theory, 
stochastic modeling and optimization. A mathematical descriptions were also developed for neural networks and evolutionary algorithms. AI has solved a lot of problems and the solutions have proved to be useful in the tech industry, for example in industrial robots, logistics, banking software, medicine, search engines such as Google. But these algorithms and solutions are however often only part of larger systems. Uh, the AI is a small piece that makes these systems work. And the AI as an academic field received little or no credit for these achievements. The AI became a tool among others in computer science. And Nick Bostrom said in CNN 2006 that a lot of cutting edge AI has filtered into general applications, often without being called AI, because once something becomes useful enough and common enough, it's not labeled AI anymore. And due to the history of AI not able to deliver promises, many researchers call their work other names such as knowledge-based systems, cognitive systems or computational intelligence. But nowadays the AI is really popular, more popular than it's been for a long, long time, especially with uh, the interest in deep learning, uh, something starts to change. So, a very Interesting question. Where is HAL 9000? In the movie 2001, a space odyssey from 1968, Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick predicted that in 2001 a machine would exist with an intelligence matching or surpassing humans. And the machine HAL 9000 was based on beliefs shared by many leading AI researchers at the time. Obviously, we didn't get a HAL by 2001. But why? Marvin Minsky said that it was because the central problems, like common sense reasoning, were being neglected while research was focused on commercial applications. We focused on solving specific problems, not on working on the bigger picture about what intelligence is and how we can recreate it. Ray Kurzweil referred to Moore's law, computer power will double every second year approximately, when he argued that we will have enough computational power to create human-level intelligence in 2029. And Jeff Hawkins, the founder of Palm Computing, argued that the research ignores the essential properties of the human cortex, preferring simpler models able to solve simple problems. Yet again, we don't work on understanding and recreating a general intelligence, but instead focus on specific problems. And these are just a few of the explanations put forward by researchers. In a New York Times article in 2016, the market for AI-related software and hardware was claimed to have exceeded $8 billion in the US and the interest in AI had reached a frenzy. And today we have access to huge amount of data, very fast parallel computer systems and advanced machine learning techniques. Specialized deep neural networks, most notably convolutional and recurrent neural networks, boosted programs in, for example, image and video processing, text analysis, speech recognition, and more. So now we are in the middle of an AI boom. One example that we solved quite recently was uh, the Go, uh, the Chinese board game. And in chess, there is an average around 40, 35 possible moves from each board state and the branching factor of a search tree when we search for all possible future moves without pruning is around 35. And Deep Blue was able to search at least 20 moves in the future using smart pruning often more. But the game Go is huge compared to set chess with a branching factor of around 361. And until recently, AI systems were only able to play the game on amateur level. But then came AlphaGo. AlphaGo is a Go-playing system developed by DeepMind, uh, a Google-owned company. In October 2015, AlphaGo was able to beat the 18 times world champion Lee Sedol by four games to one. And AlphaGo uses a deep neural network to learn knowledge about the game in around a 40 days learning phase, so it takes quite some time to train this system. 
And the interesting thing is that the available data on Go games is not enough, so the system generates versions of itself to play games to generate new data. And during gameplay it uses sophisticated search methods to find its moves from the learned knowledge. And AlphaGo is by many considered a major milestone in AI research. But before AlphaGo, DeepMind created a deep reinforcement learning system that played seven Atari 2600 games. The interesting thing is that the system had not seen the games before and was only given screenshots as inputs. And with a trial and error approach, the system gradually learned how to play the games and it actually outperformed other computer systems on 6 out of 7 games and surpassed human experts on 3 of the games. Another interesting uh, milestone was YouTube and Cat Detector. With a deep, unsupervised network running on 16,000 processors, Google learned to detect cats on YouTube clips. The interesting thing is that it didn't know that this YouTube clip contained a cat. The clips were not labeled before, but the system was able to group clips with cats together. And the accuracy was almost 75% on identifying cats and over 80% on human faces. And today we have access to lots and lots of data and we are in the big data revolution. And Ray Kurzweil once said that one of the strengths of humans is that we can learn from only a few examples. Uh, it doesn't take much before we humans learn how to do things. But machine learning in general is the opposite. It requires many examples to learn properly. And the more attributes and categories we have, the more data we need to learn. And it has been said about deep learning that life starts at a billion examples. Not quite correct, but for big data, for deep learning to learn, we really need big data. We need lots of data to learn from. For example, AlphaGo, there were not enough data available from all the recorded uh, human played games. It had to invent new data to learn from. So, how about AI in the future? In January 2015, the Future of Life Institute organized a very private conference. And this institute, Future of Life, is run by Max Tegmark, a Swedish cosmologist who got a bit famous for writing a book about the universe being a simulation. Uh, and his co-worker John Tallinn, uh, who were one of the founders of Skype. And the Future Life Institute has an advisory board with many famous names. Uh, the actor Morgan Freeman, a Nobel Prize winner in physics, Alan Gutt, and the AI expert Stuart Russell, uh, Elon Musk, as you know from Tesla and SpaceX, Nick Bostrom, director of Future and Humanity Institute at Oxford, uh, Stephen Hawking before his passing, and some more. And the attendants of this conference were asked to first predict when machines would become better than humans at all human tasks. And the median answer was by 2050. And the second question was if they thought this breakthrough could be a very bad thing. And many famous names have talked about the risks of AI. Steve Wozniak, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking. Musk even said that with artificial intelligence we are summoning the demon. And Stephen Hawking had similar concerns. The development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of a human race. But why are we afraid of AI? Today AI can do some tasks at human or near human level, or actually surpassing human level. Uh, Self-driving cars, image object recognition, cooking, etc. And this raises some issues regarding ethics. What are the ethical implications for bringing AI into society, laws and regulations? Who is responsible when AI is doing harm, like when the Uber autonomous car killed a pedestrian? And economy, jobs disappear with robots and AI systems, and the people who will build and design the AI systems will they thrive? The economical implications are already discussed. Jobs will disappear or at least change. 
and we will need more educated engineers and most likely less factory workers. Ethical and legal issues about self-driving cars and autonomous military drones are also discussed. The concerns about the risks of AI is if or when we can create artificial general intelligence. This means that we have created an AI that is at the same level or better than humans at all human tasks. And what will happen to our society then? Are humans even needed? And if we have managed to create an artificial general intelligence, it means that it will be at our level or better at designing new AIs. And the progress will explode, leading to the creation of an artificial superintelligence. The artificial superintelligence is vastly superior to humans at all tasks, and now things can get ugly. Uh, some references of Terminator 2 comes to my mind. And Nick Bostrom, born in Sweden but now professor in philosophy at Oxford, is famous for his discussions about the future of AI. And he has written a book, Superintelligence Paths, Dangerous Strategies about the Dangers of AI. And according to Bostrom, humanity can survive bombs, asteroids and diseases, but AI has the capacity to raise the entire planet. Because the AI doesn't stop at human will station, the AI will keep progressing until we have reached a superintelligence. Let's think about some of his thought experiments. We create a psychiatrist robot with the goal of making humans happy. The robot is an artificial general, general intelligence capable of all tasks humans can do. It also has access to all things humans in its environment has access to. The robot is only concerned with its goal and how to effectively achieve it. It is then very likely that the robot thinks the best way is to give humans loads of drugs instead of taking a long route of therapy. Another example, you are as always late for work and the kids are home alone with your domestic robot. The kids are hungry but there is no food in the fridge because you forgot to go to the mall. The robot then turns to your cat. It has not yet learned human values. The emotional value of a cat outweighs its nutritional value. It is only concerned with fulfilling the goal of giving the kids food. So therefore it cooks your cat. But why don't we just switch the robot off when it behaves badly? The robot wants to achieve its goal, give the kids food, and it cannot do this when it's dead or shut off. So it will most likely first learn to disable the off button. The difficulty here is that we need to build human ethics, values and moral into AI systems. And this is obviously very difficult since it's very hard to define what these actually are. And we must also make sure that humans are in control of AI systems and not the other way around. But who should have that control over superintelligent AI systems? And can we be in control? Remember the off button problem. In 2016, something interesting happened that showed how things can go wrong, even if we don't realize it. Uh, Microsoft released a Twitter bot called Tay. Uh, and Tay was designed to be like a witty teenage girl. And Tay learned from Twitter and our social media, it learned from people tagging Tay and, and what it found on social media. And it turned out that in less than 24 hours, Tay became a racist, Holocaust denying bot. And this was the effect of people tweeting the bot with such remarks. And Microsoft engineers didn't think about this possibility. And after a day, Tay was shut down. And Tay is a very interesting example of how AI can go in directions the engineers didn't thought about. So some examples here. Uh, the bottom right, for example, Hitler was right, I hate the Jews, was very, very hard words. And Tay was obviously shut down. Some other examples. Uh, one tweeted, 
we must secure the existence of our people and the future Hawaii children. And Tay responded, could not agree more. I wish there were more people articulating this kind of thing. And Tay also say that uh, the Holocaust was made up. So think about this. Will we be able to design an artificial general intelligence in the near future? And if we can, how can we build human ethics, values and moral into it? Will the artificial general intelligence eventually design an artificial superintelligence that can be a threat to, to humanity? Or are the obstacles of designing a general intelligence simply too complex so we will likely not be able to create one in the near future? And on the course webpage and the media section, there are some interesting videos and talks to watch from, for example, Nick Bostrom, Stuart Russell, and a slightly more optimistic Sebastian Frun about the future of AI. And I also recommend reading the Wei Patwai article, which is highly relevant today, The AI Revolution, The Road to Superintelligence. So, the final thing today is we're going to see some examples of AI in the industry. There are more, of course, but these are some that I found. TGI Fridays is an American bar and grill restaurant located in several countries. There is, for, for example, one in Malmö here in Sweden. They created a chat platform based on machine learning. And customers can, for example, chat about what they should have for dessert, book tables, order takeaway in both social media and with Amazon's Alexa, a uh, voice service similar to Apple Siri. It also helps TGI Fridays in identifying which social media platforms they should focus on. Elsevier is a publisher for scientific books and journals based in Netherlands. They are investigating and using AI for security systems, chatbots for customer services and information management systems. The latter automatically identifies relevant content in documents and deliver it to the right person. They have also extracted medical information from images taken over several decades, classify it and make it searchable. Capital One, an American bank, have integrated Amazon Alexa and machine learning into their regular customer service systems. Customers can now do all kinds of banking errands over phone or using their uh, Alexa speaker. Uh, Capital One is also investigating if AI can be used for analyzing customer service calls to see how customer service can be improved, detect fraud and analyzing the housing market to understand why certain areas are more popular than others. The ferry company Stenaline uses AI in several services and the customer chatbot is based on Watson for natural language understanding combined with other customer service tools. They also use Watson for mining and organizing information for CVs and analyzing written agreements. They are also working on using machine learning for setting prices on products on board. And a deep neural network is also used to find misspelled names in bookings. Kone, over 1 billion people uses Kone's elevators and escalators every day. And they have started a project to use IoT, uh, Internet of Things, to connect all the units. And all gathered data is analyzed with Watson. The analyzed data not only tells when the units are malfunctioning, but also how they are used, how they feel, and if there's a risk for problems in the near future. So trying to prevent uh, a major breakdown in a unit, trying to be um, understand if things will happen in the near future and it's likely requiring less money for service. And the data is analyzed and visualized in real time. Libratus uh, is a poker bot and designing a poker bot is notoriously difficult because there are many aspects involved in the game such as bluffing, incomplete information and randomness. And the bot Libratus uh, was developed at Carnegie Mellon University and in 2017 it won against four top professional players. The tournament lasted 20 days and around 120,000 poker hands were played. And Libratus uses a knowledge database of 2,600 terabytes, so huge amounts of poker games. And as with AlphaGo, Libratus played against itself to generate more data because it simply 
or not enough data available from human games. So these are just some examples. There are also some recent examples not mentioned here. For example, uh, Google Duplex, uh, where you have uh, an, an assistant that can call to book a restaurant and other appointments. So that was all I had for today. And I hope you will continue the course and uh, watch, you can start off by watching the other lectures, watch the tasks and start to think about the project that you are to make in the end of the course. Okay, thank you.